Andy Warhol's idea for the package is basically an ahem, extra large innuendo of the Sticky Fingers title, showing a close up of a jeans clad male crotch with a visible outline of a penis. And were you going to say something? No, I'm waiting on you. Oh, see, I, I, I murmured penis, so I thought you, would, <laughs> you would make me say it again. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, I'll do it over again. Okay. Hey, everyone, it's Elliot and Todd. Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar, an ongoing conversation about pop culture and iconic design. Today we continue talking about the formation of the pop art scene. And the introduction of its greatest superstar. He made the lowbrow highbrow. And along the way agitated a lot of people. So let's raise our glasses to the master manipulator himself back here in the bar. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> Elliot, I have a, a question for you. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Are you, did, were you clearing your throat? Did our listeners need to hear that? <sighs> I had to get a drink. Oh, 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 sorry. Well, and, and you didn't bring me a drink. Okay, I see. I see what we're doing. I'm sorry. I thought you knew English. I just said, I have to get a drink. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, let's fight about that later because I have a quick hey, question. Hey, you know what? You. What? There's an I in Elliot. There is no I in Todd, okay? So I don't want <laughs> well, to hear you, it. You go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't argue with that, uh, with that logic, I guess. Um, but one <laughs> thing we can argue about, uh, let me ask you this question. Okay. Do you think an amazing book cover can sell a half-decent book? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I would say absolutely, right? I think there are some mediocre book cover designs that have been elevated because the book was a success and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. And what about album covers? Like, when I think of great albums, I pretty much think their covers are great, too. Like, is there one where you think the album of music was way better than the cover design? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, when you think about it, there are a lot of personality-driven solo albums that basically mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. the artist mug on the front, right? But there's no real concept outside of a, the their famous idea, right? Like, oh, right. whatever, Phil Collins, Madonna, George Michael, whomever. It's like, oh, that person, I'll buy their stuff, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, thinking about it a little bit, here's an album I think that you and I both love. And I would say... The Exit Planet Dust cover from the Chemical Brothers, their first oh, album that has the, yeah. the hippies walking on the front of it, um, yeah, it yeah. really makes zero sense with the, the music contained on it. Um, I think that could have been different to the point that much later after the album came out, I was wondering like where that came from. And to not get too far off topic, apparently they wanted the anti-electronica look right they wanted it to be oh. as sort of analog and hippy dippy ish as possible and i i would argue uh. they succeeded <laughs> uh, yeah totally like I, I think if you didn't know the chemical brothers and you were just in the store you saw that that would not be the music you would expect to hear <laughs> not from, at all from that cover um at all but yeah that's that's a good one so since this is part two of our series on andy warhol's influence on music and album covers Dear listener, if you haven't heard part one, go back and take a listen to that, where you get to hear us talk about things such as pink banana meat and Cirque du Soleil on acid. Okay, yeah, there's much, much more than that. You know what, Todd, <laughs> I should probably give it a listen to. Okay, so <laughs> why, why are we talking about this again? Didn't we cover all our bases last time? Well, we did, but this is a little bit further along 
in the timeline. And I got to thinking about stuff. Think about how we connect with the world through our senses. Smell, taste, touch, sight, sound. I might argue context, too. Okay. A musical artist connects with us through the sound that we might hear on the radio or through streaming services or through recordings if we're buying albums. And that audio experience has been packaged and is literally audio is sitting on a shelf somewhere or you know sitting on your screen somewhere and so maybe I'm going to get the particular recording maybe I'm shopping maybe I heard a little something about the artist and this visual pushes me to buy if I have a limited budget and one cover is cooler than the other you know so now I buy that and now I have a sound and sight experience Okay, so going back to the banana, the peeling of the banana, our friend Andy was able to add the tactile to sight and sound, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and if he had thought about it, uh, he probably would have added a banana smell to the Velvets album, or even a crotch smell to the album cover we're going to be digging into today, Sticky Fingers. Uh, yeah, your second idea, I'm not sure how that would have helped sales. <laughs> You don't think. Hey, well, we're going to unpack that a little bit, so to speak. Our moment in time for today's episode is April 23rd, 1971. Geez, Todd, you couldn't zero in and get any more specific? Absolutely. And you know why we're going to talk about that? Because that was George Lopez's 10th birthday. And also, <laughs> Hervé Villachez's 28th birthday. Lee Major celebrated his 32nd birthday. Okay, Todd, I know these are your three favorite celebrities, but let's get to the point here. Okay, all right, yeah. And the Rolling Stones released Sticky Fingers, their 10th album in seven years. And, you know, that was kind of a big deal. When the Rolling Stones albums are ranked by all the critics and magazines, this one ranks at the very top, or actually very near the top, two on all of the list. And I've got a quote here, Elliot that I, uh, I found because I thought you would particularly love it. Okay, hit me. The Guardian, you know, British um, newspaper, what they said about Sticky Fingers is, uh, the la- I'm quoting, quote, the late 60s curdling from buttercup sandwich optimism to grim bleakness could have finished the Rolling Stones, drug busts, deaths, murderous hell's angels at Altamont, but in truth, it suited them. Virtually from the moment they started writing songs, Jagger and Richards were drawn to darkness. Certainly they were better at depicting decay and decadence than delivering pie-eyed hippie beatitudes. (laughs) Unquote. (laughs) Okay. Buttercup sandwich. (laughs) Pie-eyed hippie beatitudes. Man, you've just got to love the British press. And yeah, i got to yeah. be honest with you, it makes me wonder what sort of uh, quote-unquote fertilizer those buttercups were planted in. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine. I, I can't even imagine. But so that's, you know, that's a good capture of the sound. And um, let me describe the package, the album cover, in case a listener has just flown in from Neptune and is not familiar. You sure it wasn't Uranus? Uh, no comment on that. Okay, we'll let that one pass. Uh, Andy Warhol's idea for the package is basically an uh, extra-large innuendo of the Sticky Fingers title showing a close-up of a jeans-clad male crotch with a visible outline of a penis. So, uh, so a pink banana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so to speak, so to speak. The cover of the original vinyl LP uh, featured a working zipper and perforations around the belt buckle that opened to reveal an image of a male in white briefs. Okay, so uh, engaging another sense, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, tactile. Three for five so far. No smell or taste yet. From, mm, yeah, uh, no scratch and sniff. Probably a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> Probably for this one, yeah. The vinyl release, it actually displayed the band's name and uh, album title along the belt, unlike the Velvet Underground album, uh, which we talked about in our previous episode, didn't have the band's name on there. And behind the working zipper, the underpants were rubber stamped with Andy Warhol's name. And below that, it reads just kind of this um, ambiguous statement, this photograph may not be, etc. 
So, uh, <laughs> That's who awesome. Knows? <laughs> yeah, I know. So he's who still knows? he's still managed to work his name in there really large somehow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so what happened was this artwork was conceived by Warhol, and he pitched it to Mick Jagger at a club, and they were talking about album packages for the next record, and Andy said. Wouldn't it be fun to put a blue jean zipper on the cover? And Mick Jagger said, Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, man. And uh, the ball was rolling after that. Yeah, uh, so to speak. (laughs) Uh, Okay, 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 okay. Um, We're punning all over the place on this. Uh, We're going to take a slight detour for the calls here. Um, And like our friend, A.C. Rudy Lehman from the past recent episode who worked on the Velvet Underground banana cover with Andy. And I don't believe he got the recognition he deserved, honestly. There was a designer named Craig Braun who began his career as a die cutter and a sticker printer. And his first major break coming to him was when he was asked to assist a certain famous pop artist who was developing an idea of a removable banana sticker. And Andy Warhol became somewhat of a mentor to Craig. So in 70 and 71, he was asked to work with Andy on the Sticky Fingers cover, too. Wow. Okay. So how is it that Craig Braun became so involved with these two iconic projects? Well, so at first, um, well, he was an expert at printing vinyl stickers. And by 1971, Uh, He had developed a strong reputation as a designer and packaging engineer. So he had a major role in kind of bringing these two pop culture gemstones to life. Uh, But if he had had his way, it would have been very different. And you know why? Because I think it's pretty widely known. The crotch idea with the working zipper uh, that Andy conceived Craig, as kind of a packaging engineer, saw the challenges. Like, why would you put metal over a piece of vinyl music? Like, that may not work out right. (laughs) Yeah, it seems sort of problematic, yeah. Right, right. So he did some other concepts. Let me pitch a few of them to you, okay? Oh, man, this is great. Hit me. Okay, here we go. One was a triptych of a castle Keith Richards had in the south of France. And once you open it up, you see the inside of the castle with all this equipment and speakers everywhere. I think this was the inspiration of Castle Grayskull. It, it Maybe. It okay. It didn't, didn't quite sound like Rolling Stones to me, but no. anyway. All right, so we went in the other direction. A public execution in the middle of the desert. Mick's head is cut off and these two nude ladies are reaching for it. Uh, wasn't this later made as seven? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe that's where they got the idea. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> maybe so, yeah. All right, how about this? Uh, an underwater photo. Uh, so you're underwater shooting up towards the surface, and he okay. created these large printouts of the Rolling Stones' heads looking into the pool. Um, you know, maybe not a horrible idea, but this was right after Brian Jones was found dead in his swimming pool, so... So Nirvana later did something with that. So Nirvana finally did that a little bit later, yeah. Um, but lastly, I mean, this bears mentioning here, because this is really the uh, one concept that continued to see the light of day. He had conceived wrapping the whole album in a uh, rolling paper. So how that happened was he was getting high one night, had bamboo <laughs> rolling papers in front of him, and he noticed they were square, like an album cover, and thought, bamboo rolling stones papers. So he he pitched the idea, the record company loved it, and they said, Yeah, we're sticking with the zipper though. So he actually ended up selling that idea to Cheech and Chong to very huge success. So he pitched the idea to the record label. The record label says sounds great, but the Rolling Stones were big enough. They had audit control over the record label and said no way. They did. Yeah. And particularly Mick Jagger, because after all those ideas, Mick just couldn't be swayed away from the crotch. Hmm. I'd heard a rumor... I suggest maybe we take a little break on that comment and come back. What you think? Mm, Taking a break. Hey, that sounds like a great idea, Mr. Pop Art. Why don't Uh you pop on over to the bar and get me another drink? Oh, boy. We'll be back.
Hi, we want to take a moment to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, we have an archive of topics ranging from the Olympics to movie posters. Think Ghostbusters. Iconic images. Think Bigfoot. Punk music. The Ramones. Saturday morning cartoons. The Pink Panther. And failed products like OK Soda. Visit our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com for full episode notes and visuals, the latest blog content, and to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Find the links on our website or search using the phrase Two Designers Walk Into a Bar. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people like you find podcasts like this. And tell a friend about us. Send them a link to our podcast from your listening platform of choice. And if you're inclined, buy our merchandise. Stickers, coasters, magnets, t-shirts. We're designers. We make good stuff and it helps support the show. Get in touch. Use the contact form on our website or send an email to hello at two designers walk into a bar.com. We read every message we get. Honest. And we're available for speaking gigs. Email us to learn more. Okay, now, back to the bar. Let me uh, kind of continue the story of Craig Braun and, and how Sticky Fingers came to life. When Craig got Andy's front and rear Polaroids, because Andy took the photos, but let's say that for now. Uh, there'll be a little more about that later. Okay. They were all really shitty gray images, like... You know, like Polaroids are. So he <laughs> yes. figured he would use posterization, which was a pretty new technique at the time. And just real briefly, not to get too design wonky, but posterization is basically creates a high contrast between dark and light hues. And he did several of them, so it gave more of a range of um, layers, if you will, because other than that, the photo was gray. Um, and then he had what's called a mesotint, made of the posterization and that's basically a texture that um, the film uh, is shot through a filter and it makes little tiny dots kind of like stippled or denim like texture so it turned out looking really really cool right because i yeah, yeah i always thought of it as being very so for folks who may not and obviously we'll put the album art on our episode page but um Think about it as kind of like a crummy Xerox look. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like a yeah. high contrast Xerox, which is how a lot of like music flyers at the time were made and stuff. So it kind of had a little bit of a punk edge to me. It did. Yeah. And of course, it fit the texture of denim. And really, the star of, uh, of the front cover, well, one of the stars of the front cover was the, uh, the was pink the banana. Zipper. Oh. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, that. Um, so Craig reached out to the executive VP of uh, Talon Zippers, and he tried to get them for free. And he was saying, like, hey, your zippers will be everywhere around the world. They'll be on every Rolling Stone record. And the VP was saying, well, we're already known, <laughs> Craig was, but you're going to be known doubly. You're going to be known triply. And the VP said... <laughs> That's kind of like getting a printer to print your uh, album sleeve for free. Right, so it'll right, be right. everywhere. <laughs> right. And the uh, zipper VP kind of had the last word when he said, I don't think you understand, sir. Our customers are not people who buy records. They're in the garment industry, and we already have all of that. So me, no. I'm not going for it. <laughs> <laughs> Guy was very, very smart. So uh, they eventually figured out uh, a different zipper maker to go with? Yeah, yeah. They found another zipper maker uh, and got a good price. And Again, you know, being the packaging engineer with his experience, he knew that the zipper would damage the vinyl. So he had this idea to design uh, a third panel into the album cover. So not just, you know, a, a fold over to hold the record, but another third panel to come over and be behind the zipper on the front cover. And he thought that would be really cool to have the same front cover model on that panel printed wearing tidy whities okay so he turned what was a utilitarian idea into a concept that's mm -hmm. actually super smart yeah it is yeah so the vinyl is now sold um with a printed zipper 
today, right? It mm-hmm. was really only mm-hmm. this original run that had the working zipper. Um, and I had heard that the record company was getting tons of complaints about the zipper damaging the records. Um, so, like, what's the deal? Did they immediately stop printing them? So Craig thought he had prevented the problem with the uh, interior underwear panel. Mm-hmm. But he didn't think about shipping. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so they ship albums. Back then, they would ship 25 albums per box. And they would stack these boxes, you know, six or seven high in a truck. And then truck them hundreds of miles uh, to a location. <laughs> so these things are getting bounced around. They're getting slammed on each other, getting crunched. Pressed, uh, yeah. Yeah, pressed, yeah, because they're, they're, yeah. they're stacked horizontally. It's not like they're like books on a bookshelf vertically. Right, 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 right. Okay, so do we know if or how the records were damaged? Like, what happened? Yeah, so the pull of the zipper um, was pressed into the sister morphine track on side two. And there's a whole lot of drama that went into that uh, because the record company was getting complaints. They were going to sue Craig. So... Uh, he came up with a solution that I think actually adds to the concept. He determined that if you unzipped the zipper halfway, the nib would fall on the center disc label, and that even made the concept even more risky. You know, so sort of half-zipped denim jeans on the cover. And so concerning the production of that newer idea, Craig says... When it comes to the end of the conveyor belt, we'll have these little old ladies pulling the zippers down and then putting the albums in shrink wrap machines. It'll be a winner. (laughs) Okay, hold on a second. (laughs) Little old ladies. Okay. I would have loved to have seen that help wanted ad. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, wouldn't you? Grandma's making a few extra bucks. Yeah, pulling zippers down. Um, Okay. (laughs) Yeah. What'd you do today, Grandma? <laughs> How was I pulled work? about a thousand zippers down. <laughs> and Grandma doesn't report to a dry cleaner. Okay, so the big question here is, I think everyone wants to know, who's the model, right? Who's the guy? That's right. Well, there has been so much conversation, and I kind of, I dug a lot into this because there has been so much conversation. And uh, Todd, was it, can I... Yeah. Take a guess. Yeah, yeah. Was it Bigfoot? It, you know, great guess because, you know, I do love Bigfoot. Um, yeah. And, and you can hear an episode about that, dear listener. And you've done all the homework. So I thought, well, maybe he figured this out during it would his make research. Sense. It would make sense. But, you know, in typical style, Andy Warhol never told who it was. Right away, it was presumed to be Mick Jagger, obviously. Um, People involved with the photo shoot immediately shot that down, and they said that Andy claimed that he photographed several men, and by Andy photographing, what they meant was his assistant, Billy Name, photographed several men, and Jagger wasn't even on the list. So he never revealed which shots were used, and let's face it, they were all very similar. Andy had a type, right? (laughs) Yeah, I would say the type is, uh, what, well hung and crazy? (laughs) Well, I think that accurately covers it. Yeah, yeah. But let's talk about some of the candidates. Okay. Uh, He shot uh, a guy named Jed Johnson, who was his lover at the time. Um, And he denied that it was his likeness. And he also had a twin brother named Jay Johnson um, that was shot for the album cover. And um, he was uh, denying that that was actually him. With the last name, though, I could imagine it could be either one of them. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. I think Jay Johnson would have been a a wonderful candidate just by the name alone. And another name thrown around was a Warhol superstar, you know, Jackie Curtis. You know, she thought she was James Dean for a day, right? (laughs) Rebel without a cause. That's right. Yeah, Valium couldn't help that bash. Um, Now, probably one of the most... um, public about this was Warhol superstar Joe D'Alessandro. He claims to have been the model. And I'd say there's a little possibility that little Joe was the inside model wearing the tidy whities But most close to the session agree that tidy whitey guy was one of the editors of Interview Magazine, a guy named Glenn O'Brien. Uh, okay, hold on. Back up for a second. So All right. 
What makes you say there's a possibility it was D. Allen Sandro? Well, so Little Joe was in a number of Warhol movies. And I'm sorry, he doesn't like that name, Little Joe, but um, it, that's the reference in Walk on the Wild Side. So, <laughs> um, Joe <laughs> D'Alessandro uh, was in a number of Warhol movies, and some of them he even had clothes on. Wow. So there's a resemblance to the inside guy, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. And although Craig Braun asked to use the same model for the inside flap as the outside flap, there are obvious contours that shows he did not use the same model. <laughs> this is great. Okay, so even <laughs> though he asked Andy to use the same model on the inside as he did on the outside, he just ignored them. Well, yeah, there's a shocker. Uh, you know, he probably just couldn't remember between shoots who was who, right? Yeah, I mean, that's legit, right? Um, but the guy, most people agree, even... Uh, those super close to the shoot, Glenn O'Brien, he recalls at the time there was an architect's office next door to the factory. Uh, this is when they were at Union Square. Okay. And he had his jeans pulled down around his ankles, and Andy is kneeling in front of him with his Polaroid. And uh, Andy's manager, Fred Hughes, is making rude remarks like, Can't you make it any bigger? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then the door to the office opens up, and these guys walk in, and they're wearing suits, and they're kind of dumbfounded. And one of them says, uh, um, this isn't the architect's office, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, if I'd been there, I would have said, no, it is. Come on in. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the album, obviously, is a huge success uh, musically. Visually, uh, all of that was working that day. Uh, here's a little bit of salary info for you, Elliot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's get into some numbers. Yeah. Warhol, um, you know, the name attached to the cover, got $4,000 for a few Polaroids, basically. Craig Braun got, hold on to your seat, no less than $300,000 in 1971. And he said he had 20 wow. people working for him. Okay. Right? Um, and the poor model got $75. Person so, X. And now, yeah. when you say the model, is that the outside guy or the inside guy? Uh, both. Both got 75 <laughs> Okay. <laughs> really generous, right? Yeah, nice. Yeah. So, uh, so what is $300,000 in today's money? How does all this shake out? For, for Really, for all these guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, we'll start... Uh, with Warhol, who got originally four thousand dollars in '71, that would be over twenty-nine thousand dollars now. Okay, not bad. Craig Braun, who got three hundred thousand, no less than three hundred thousand, he says, um, in today's money is two point two million, like two million two hundred twenty-eight thousand four hundred forty-four uh, dollars, which is a crap ton of money. Yeah. But not to be outdone, the poor model would have 500 bucks uh, in his pocket for, <laughs> okay. you know, for a shot there. Todd, I would love to finish this episode with you, but I've got to call some people about a $2 million package design project. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, Craig Braun did okay, right? Yeah, more than okay, yeah. He also gets credit for the famous tongue logo, uh, the Rolling Stones tongue logo. We're not going to go into that right now because there's a whole lot of drama surrounding that too, but we'll save that for another time. But to quote rock critic Richard Harrington, he says this album heralded an age of really imaginative and provocative packaging. It also introduced the greatest band logo of all time, which... We might arm wrestle over that, Mr. Harrington, because, Elliot, we had an episode on rock logos, right? We did. We did. And, Todd, I know you love Herman's Hermits, but I'm still disputing with you. They did not, in fact, have the best logo. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and you thought the Partridge family. Ah, come on. <laughs> come okay, on. so let's take a step back here. Okay. Um, right. So what do you think Warhol did differently than influenced album design? Well, you know, we already talked about, we started this by talking about the senses, how they were kind of engaged, and he added interaction to a very utilitarian piece, um, which was really, you know, his pop art philosophy, right? 
he made it more valuable. In turn, he made the product and the music more valuable. So let me ask you, uh, can you think of music packaging that might have been influenced by Andy's idea of adding more interaction? Hmm, great question. So the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that so many bands have their roots in art school, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think about one of the bands that everybody sort of points to when that phrase is brought up is the Talking Heads. Um, yeah, yeah. Stefan Sagmeister made that album <laughs> where the old guy's face uh, on the cover was overprinted in red and green inks, and it kind of creates mm-hmm, these mm-hmm. crazy double images. Um, very by the Pet Shop Boys that came out in the 90s. You know, Pentagram mm-hmm. had designed this orange jewel case that was solid plastic and really looked like a Lego. And from mm-hmm. what I understand, mm-hmm. it like totally went way <laughs> over budget for the <laughs> uh, record label. And um, it was a bit because they had to make all these custom molds and everything. And <laughs> what's funny is I remember this later, I'm sure with the digital downloads, but I remember I have one of those original CDs, actually. Hmm. And I remember when the CD was reissued, they mm-hmm. just, <laughs> the front cover was a photograph <laughs> like of the other cover just sitting on white. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it was like, well, you missed it. You missed the original jewel case. This here's is what the you're music, missing. But here's what it would have looked like if you'd, if you'd yeah. acted sooner, which I think is great. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's some great packages uh, for music throughout the years. And uh, I mean, there's so many, too many to list here. We certainly can include them. Back in the day, it, it even like Bob Marley and the Whalers, Catch a Fire, mm-hmm. like that was from uh, April of 1973. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, the cover art looks like and it even opens like uh the sort of old school zippo lighter uh which was helping listeners realizing the phrase catch a fire was less about a philosophical uprising (laughs) and more about something else (laughs) do tell (laughs) do tell i know i know so this was a fun walk through some famous iconic pop album covers and i think What I really love is knowing these famous covers, these people who are behind all these famous covers, ran into problems from creative to completion. You know, sometimes we look at these iconic things and sort of have expected they sprung whole cloth into these very cool, very familiar, iconic things. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of luck, right? Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, speaking of my good luck in your hard work... Uh, I know where this is headed. All right. We'll see everyone next time right here around the bar. And I will have a fresh drink. <laughs>